And the reason is because no one language contains everything. You got it? Any of you who have studied another language know this. You start off with looking for what's called isomorphism, which is a one-to-one -one relationship between your given language and the language you're learning. But what eventually happens is you find words that don't exist, don't even have a meaning in your language. They're referring to an experience completely outside of the framework of your language. And sometimes it's even a sound. And what do you do? What you usually do is you just start using the word, and one day you understand it. And that's because that's how language works. It's generative. In other words, you, you have the ability as a language learner to take on new terms and the relationship to your own la language transform the terms. So what happens is when colonizers would colonize people, they would want to throw their terms on people, but then they're encountering all kinds of things they didn't understand. And while and the people who are being dominated also see things they don't understand, but eventually it expands the linguistic field. <coughs> you see what I'm getting at? And so what happens then is that certain ideas among the Romans and among the Greek-speaking people, or the Latin-speaking people and the Greek-speaking people, when they began to dominate non-Greek-speaking and non-Latin-speaking non people, began to, the concepts began to become Latinized or Grecoized. You see what I'm saying? Just like Ide became idiotes. Well, the, um, certain concepts that existed in Hebrew, in Arabic, and in also Mudanetar and other African languages, those were words to refer to human that were connected to the soil, it, like terrestrial. So everybody knows Hebrew, for instance, Adama, mm -hmm. from which you get Adam, just means dirt, clay. Technically red clay because of the way blood mixed with the clay can work. So Adama means the earth uh, is transformed in the Latin word for earth, humus or homo, and you get human. Okay? Now here's the crucial part. If Adama is for the earth, the idea to be condemned or damned is to be pushed back into the earth. You see what I'm getting at? So to be damned, the damné de la terre, to be the damned of the earth, is to be people being pushed into the earth. So it's a redundant, it's a double term. You see? And so to, and to be damned <coughs> is a crucial term, because if you're wretched, it's something wrong with you, if you're a wretched person. But if you're a damned person, you never, you're right, it's something done to you. You could be condemned regardless of what you've done. You see the difference? And this is, this is crucial, because this is now moving from the liberal model of you individually like a god in your actions, to a political model, right? Where you're in the, you may find yourself dealing with political consequence and responsibility for things regardless of what you do. One of the best pieces on this is written by Carl Jaspers. If you get, it, I don't like the translation. It, it's in a book called The Question of German Guilt. That's not the right translation. The right translation is the guilt question or the responsibility question, because it's Schulfrager, okay? And Jaspers talks about political responsibility this way. Political responsibility you bear whether you individually acted or not. For instance, if the United States government misbehaves, it's and not going to matter if you say, I didn't vote for Trump. It won't matter. You, if you say, I didn't vote for the Republican Party, doesn't matter. And here's even worse. If you say, yo, I'm not an American citizen, <laughs> doesn't matter. You live here. <laughs> Political responsibility is borne by all who are within the jurisdiction Polity. You see? And so the reason that, so you can see how condemnation now becomes pretty radical. So now, 
Once we understand this, now we have a different portrait about violence to come, okay? The first portrait we have about violence, sorry, requires understanding two important logical moves. The first important logical move is that the human world, a properly human world, is dialectical. And by dialectical, what I mean is, is that it is interactive and relational. It's social. Okay? There's no way for me to interact with you, 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 or any of you, or even right now in this room. In fact, I'm speaking, and <coughs> we're communicating. It's not just, it's not me affecting you, it's also you affecting me. I look at you, I respond to you. In other words, every moment of our interaction is a reminder <coughs> that I'm not a god. I am not the world. There are others in the world. You see what I'm getting at? That's the human world. It's dialectical. What colonialism does is try to eradicate dialectical relationships and change the world into the logic of contraries. <coughs> now, anybody who studies basic Aristotelian logic or syllogistic logic knows, or Boolean logic knows, that a contrary has a universal, but the, but the universal opposite is also a universal. All things are or no things are. You see what I'm saying? And because they're both universal, they don't meet. You see? That's what a binary opposition really is. And so what colonial societies attempted to do was impose a form of Manichaeanism. And Manichaeanism was a, was a Persian brand of Christianity that took the position that goodness is physical <coughs> light and evil is the absolute physical absence of light, darkness, okay? And so that meant, and, and so for that Manichaean, the problem with reality is that the light and the dark mix. And so, you see it? So you need to get the absolute separation of light and dark to set the world right. Well, what colonialism does is to put it at a physical level to say the settler or the colonized people, to be absolutely legitimately just, must be absolutely separated from the people they colonize. Now, of, of course, there's, there's an obvious problem with that logic. This was the logic of apartheid South Africa, this was the logic of Jim Crow America. It's all over the place. The obvious problem with the logic is in order to treat their separation, somebody has to mediate it. And you know who those are. Well, historically, they were the, the vigilantism of white civil society all right, the lynchings, the violence, that's all. But also the police. And today that's still the case. The, the function of the police is to maintain the separation. Okay? Now, this is not all police because there are places in which the function of police is something very different. But in a racialized society, that's the function of police. Now, the problem with the contraries then is that. <clears throat> The very logic of an absolute contrary separation is a world without human beings. Human beings are interactive and dialectical. So what happens is <coughs> that logic basically says that interaction would be a violation of the universal positive, and that would be violence. And so that means then, if you try, literally, it means colonialism is just. So that means to try to decolonize a society is to violate justice. That's what Fanon means by decolonization is and always violent. In other words, if you try to prove to the, the, the people who are asserting the notion of a universal positive that you're going to reduce, going to get rid of that non-violent people, the only thing they would accept as a condition is its preservation. 
And so if you were to do, that's why, ultimately, so what Fanon is saying is you're wasting your time, okay? And so if you go back to the example I used earlier for self-other distinctions, the answer then is not to prove you're ethical or moral. If you're going to change it, the answer is it's got to be political. And what Fanon's argument is, is that what Euro-modern colonialism did was to create a situation that impedes, except at individual level, the capacity for ethical relations. That ultimately, at a societal level, it has to have a political response. Okay? Now, here, but here now becomes the crucial issue that people miss. When, once we've pointed out that decolonization is in and of itself violence, What people miss is Fanon argues that violence can never work as a telos, as an objective of society. They miss that part of his argument. Now, how does he, why do I say this? Well, there are two clear examples of this. The easiest one to see is the later chapter of The Damned of the Earth, where he, it's entitled, uh, when he looks at colonial, uh, the, the, the liberation <coughs> struggle and colonial disorders. If you look at that chapter, all the examples he gives of disorders and violence are of Algerians or, or the people who are the liberation fighters. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? If his aim was to valorize and romanticize violence, then why are all the people who are sick and suffering from violent actions in today's language, Arab or Berber. Do you see what I'm getting at? He gives these horrific examples, little boys who killed their best friend, a man who, who slipped up, slid open a woman because he was thinking of his dead mother, all these things. Well, to understand this, you have to go back to the earlier chapters. And what Fanon was pointing out is this in a very straightforward tactical level. Now, the Fanon who's writing The Damned of the Earth is not the Fanon who was writing Black Skin, White Mass, who had fought in, in World War II, was humiliated, became a psychiatrist, was trying to figure out how to make people healthy. The Fanon who's writing The Damned of the Earth has, has worked among the FLN in Algeria. He's trained people on techniques to resist torture. He <coughs> He had to deal with people who were torturers and torture, the tortured. He's a person who became the ambassador to the revolutionary government to set up agreements with Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, all of these places. He, you see what I'm trying to get at? This is a man of profound political experience. And this man of profound political experience observes that when you're going through the process of decolonization, you need people with a specific skill set. You just do. You need people who are willing to fight, to change, who have the right skills, who can give the rhetorical art, art articulation of fighting against colonization, etc. Okay? That's pretty clearly established, right? If you're going to be fighting for freedom, you need freedom fighters, <laughs> end of story. But a problem emerges. The problem is the freedom fighters' legitimacy emerges from freedom fighting. You see what I'm getting at? They are indigenous to the decolonizing moment of struggles. Our are, is, is that skill set appropriate for building the country after a moment of struggle? That is the, the question. And what Fanon pointed out is that the people who draw their legitimacy from the violence of the decolonial struggle will try to maintain their legitimacy by keeping the decolonial struggle going. 
which means you have to tolerate every crap they do to you because there's always a possibility the previous colonizer could come back. You see what I'm getting at? And that's where there's now abuse. And in fact, because they're skilled, they can't offer you the things, there is eventually a generation is going to be born that wasn't raised under those colonizers. The only people they know are you, <laughs> the people who lead them. And if you're going to keep telling them about decolonization, decolonization, at what, a certain point they're going to say, but what about, what about just building a better society? What, the hell is, what, what about that project? And so if you look at the logic then, the problem, a lot of people miss this, they think the violence moment is simply the struggle against the colonizer. But Fanon has given a critique of ongoing post-colonial violence. Because at that moment then, right, anybody in the society what, who, who is a cr critic of the, this decolonizing moment become a threat to it because it is now treated as intrinsically just. Now, um, there's an essay I wrote on Frankenstein and Fanon that addresses this issue. And if you think about it, if you look at the story of the creature of Frankenstein, a lot of people don't understand, Frankenstein is the creator. The creature has a problem because the creature can only see creation, creating, coming from the creator. And so the creature can only be mimetic or imitation at best. And if you look at many, many so-called post-colonial states, they are imitators of the previous colonizers. That's why there's the ongoing violence. That's his argument. How do, so he gives a very important argument that people miss. You know, at the moment, there's independence. The moment of independence is a lot like Robin Hood or Star Wars. You ever seen those films where the, the, the you know, once you get to the Sheriff Nottingham, there's an outdoor party, everybody's celebrating. Uh, and when they blow up the Death Star and they, you know, at the end of the first, uh, well, at that point, and now we find out it's four or five or six, whatever. But anyway, when they blew it up, everybody, the Jibble, I don't know, the Waki, whatever, they're all partying. Everything's supposed to be good. But of course, we know the story. If you keep the camera going, people can't party forever. At some point, they're like, you know, this party's good, but I don't want to go home. The problem, of course, is what is home? You've got to build a home. If you're going to do any revolution, you've got to build a home. You've got to have somewhere to go. But the problem is if you're locked, if somebody is, wants to stay to be the heroes, they don't want the home built. They want to keep, keep the party going, and you're going to have this problem. Okay, Things are not being built, infrastructures, all kinds of things. And a lot of you already know, do research in these areas. So what happens now, what Fanon noticed is very crucial. At the moment of, of independence, strikingly, strikingly, <coughs> the people, I'm using the people because that's the standard language, it's, it's more complicated than that, but generally speaking, can't wait to be part of the rest of the world. So what they immediately do is to create a post-colonial culture. They, in other words, they're not going to run around and talk about how to be an authentic Nigerian or uh, Ibu or Yoruba or Toza and all. No, suddenly now you can be Zulu or Toza or Tswana or you know, to, you know, to say and have your fro or your dreads or your, you know, they're different. In other words, it's living culture, right? You now you have your style pizza and uh, you may introduce to the world something from your society you didn't have before. You're part of the world. I see this all over uh, the African continent. During the periods of the settlers, a lot of people were forced to create a kind of African authenticity that was tribal. That was not the way the people were. It was created by the colonizers. Every group of people want to belong to the time in which they live. In other words, they want to be 21st century Africans, you know, not 8th century or so. Similarly, this is an issue faced in what's called the Arab world. A lot of people don't realize that Arab was a created category. I know it's shocking to many of you. 
right? Same thing with Semites. There was it was a linguistic category that was created and imposed as a racial category. But the fact of the matter is, there are people who want to imagine in Arab authenticity as back to some period where, you know, but they want to have it, but have 21st century cars and computers and blah, blah, blah. It, it's absurd. But nevertheless, what what Fanon noticed is that the good thing is at least the music, if you look at post-colonial Nigerian music, you have Fela Kuti, and, you know, all of these things happening, Numasakila, all of these ways of connecting in South Africa, etc. But there are certain institutions that stay locked in imitation. Institution number one, the economy. Institution number two, political institutions. That's why you have people in Kenya and all over the Southern African continent with white wig, powdered wigs sitting around in courtrooms playing as if they're part of the British Parliament and all this. Okay? Who says that's going to work in the society they're building? Institution number three, religion. Okay? Institution number four, and this one's very germane here, educational institutions. Universities are and schools are treated as if they were independent of colonial systems. When those were schools and universities designed to produce colonial overseers or civil servants for instance, of a colonial state. If you're going to transform it, the way culture is 20, entering the 21st century, so too much those political institutions. But what's different is the cultural ones are able to bring in their version. For instance, there are people in Africa who, different parts of Africa, who do hip hop. But they don't do LA hip hop, they don't do New York hip hop, they don't do Atlanta hip hop, they do Senegalese hip hop, Dakar hip hop, they do, you know what I mean? You know, they're in forms of hip hop cartoon. Right? There are jazz, all of them. They do their version because they're living culture. Well, similarly, Fanon argues, is they have to create their living political, educational, and so forth institutions, which means they have to break the grip of imitation. Okay? Now, this brings us to a crucial question because when Fanon was writing about violence, although he was dealing with those issues, there was another issue he wanted to deal with. And this is a big issue among the left. And a lot of people don't realize this. There is a form of leftism that is anti-statism. You already know this, right? For them, the state is an intrinsic evil. And, and in fact, a lot of people don't realize that mm -hmm. Fanon's critical effort was being waged against um, Engels, particularly the work anti during and this is where Engels defines the state as violence. Okay? Now we could argue about whether that's what Engels, I'm not saying Engels meant or not. We could argue again. But the main point is, among the people Fanon, the political thinker is engage, in, engaging, they think the state is intrinsically violent. You see what I'm saying? Or um, the only model of the state they could imagine is an imitation. This is that parliamentary, you know, it's either going to imitate the French state, the British state, the German state, the Dutch state, you know what I mean? It's always a European state. But what Fernand is saying at this point is, wait a minute, the state is nothing but a human creation. Just like the way you can have, you know, Senegalese pizza, you could have Senegalese state. Do it your way. Do you see what I'm getting at? Or, in other words, what he was saying is as a human institution, it requires human transformation. Yes? So, in a state. Oh, say your name for the chat. Oh, um, my name is Chuck. Um, in a state where, just one second, sorry. Yeah, sure. Thanks. In a state where. It, in a state that is created um, sort of during a, 
a time by violence for a specific reason with different cultures that have not organically grown um, to become the state that they are. How do you sort of reconcile that and say that you can make a state according to whatever you want? Because you still don't know, you do, that, that inherent like identity, the nationality is sort of created. Okay. So just, yeah. Well, no, but, but this, is, this is part of Fennell's argument. What, the bag of goods were sold through colonial imposition and racial imposition is the false naturalization of what's imposed on the people. All colonial systems, all racist systems, require people to maintain them. And the only transformation that can occur is through political transformation. But political transformation, that becomes the thing to theorize and to understand, you see? Because um, um, political activity, what's interesting about political activity that many people don't realize is that many people try to study politics without understanding the concept of power. And it's very weird, you notice? And then it makes it even weirder. There are a lot of people when they talk about power, they treat power as intrinsically evil. evil. Those are the same people who are anti-statists. <coughs> because states are powerful, and by definition, if, if power is evil, then states got to be evil. The problem is, they don't often explain what power is. And you can get, you can get a Eurocentric way of looking at power, you know, today, you say power, people just say Foucault. And, um, you know, it's true, you know. But, but you know, um, it's, it's a very simple, power is a very straightforward phenomenon. First of all, there's no power in nature. That's the first thing to bear in mind. Uh, so once you understand that power is something that occurs in the human world, then we have to analyze what power is. And power is basically the ability to make things happen with access to the conditions necessary for it. That's why, for instance, in Marxism, you talk about capital, okay? So let's just break this down. The word power comes from the word prot uh, protent, or protest, like you talk about omnipotent, right? All-powerful God. That doesn't tell you anything. That just goes back to Latin until you realize that the Latin got it from somewhere else. The Latin, um, I'm curious, um, how, how many words for power do you know? It's very interesting, isn't it? Many people, a lot of ancient languages, uh, there are many words to deal with each dimension of a phenomenon, okay? And so the word, just to give you an idea, the word power comes from the word pate. Now that's Italian until you know what the word pate is from, or fete. Well, the word is actually from muter, metu netur, or ancient Egyptian. And it, but it was a specific kind. See, they had other words for power. The specific kind of power it was from was the power that a people in high authority had, okay? But that doesn't really explain to you what power is. That is says they're in high authority because they have power. But it turns out, if you understand that society, those societies, actually, it's a multitude, but if you read the coffin texts, okay, the very ancient coffin texts, uh, no pute can be pute without heka. So you see the two sides coming out, right? Now, what is heka? Well, the word ka, right? It means um, like a, the, the soul, spirit, or origin, or womb. It has many meanings. So like the word Africa just means coming from the Ka. <laughs> and the Ka for them was southern, uh, upper, upper Kemet or upper Egypt, which meant coming from southern Africa, right? It, mean, it was a reference to the origins of human beings. But Ka, right, Heka, is often mistranslated. It's often translated as magic. Okay? But it could be translated as force or the facilitating agent. You see what I'm getting at? 
So the argument is, uh, uh, so like today, Hekka, it's the reason it translated often mistaken is magic, is because you ever heard the expression, put a hex on you? Mm -hmm. Hex is from the word Hekka, mm -hmm. okay? So, so the argument was that a king or a queen or an official can't do anything without Hekka. You see? Hekka is that force through which things move or make manifest. Now, if you think about it, then um, if you have power, right, even if, even if you have embedded in you the ability to walk, unless the conditions are met that would enable you to walk, which is the hekka, you cannot walk. If it doesn't really matter if I have vocal cords, if we don't have a language through which it can actually have meaning. It, then I will just be making noise. Now, the reason this is crucial is because, you see, what early humanity understood is that the human animal, the heka, I'm just using that because I just said heka to make it easy, um, or power, is going to be within the physical reach of that animal. If I want to drink some of this lemonade, I have to reach it and drink it. If it's on the other side of the room, I have to walk over to it and get it. However, human beings are, live in a world of culture and language. And what culture and language do is that although I'm here, I don't have to walk right up to you, you know what I'm saying, and touch you to be in a relationship with you. Similarly, because this is being videotaped, it means when, when people who are, I'll never even meet, you'll never meet, will be connected to what's happening here. And, when, and if it's preserved, when we die off, other people can be affected by it. So what, it, what has happened is our technologies and our language have expanded our reach, okay? So power is actually the expression of the human world's ability to do things. If you didn't have power, you couldn't get it this morning. If you didn't have power, you wouldn't be able to eat, you wouldn't be able to understand. But power infuses the human world. Education is power. Knowledge really is power. But also within that, our, our, our greatest exemplification <coughs> of the mythic level of power is a god. But you see, if you think of a god, and Freud wrote about this in um, on um, this satisfaction and civilization. It's translated civilization discontent, but it's, it's a little the German is a, it's more precise. <coughs> what 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 goes on is that if you think about a God, what do we ask for from gods? We ask gods to protect us from the elements. We ask God to protect our bodies, keep us healthy. And we ask gods to protect us from one of the greatest sources of misery ever, each other. All right? And in fact, and the way the gods do that is give us laws, regulations, whether it's Torah, Quran, you name it, Upanishads, whatever it may be. But if you take gods out, what, what Freud argued, and what, and this is where it's crucial, we put in a prosthetic God, and that prosthetic God is culture. And in culture, we produce buildings, shelter, medicine. We produce laws, regulations to deal with each other. We do all those things. And the infusion of that power in our institutions, because is an effort to bring stability to our existence, and that's what a state is. The problem is that as a human institution, members of states could try to hoard power, and they, and they create an efficiency or zero-sum notion of power, which means I have power to the extent to which you do not. And that now begins to create oppression and domination. However, if one realizes that the only way even those states can make that power work is by people acting on them. 
then it has to be how the social world manifests power that changes those states. But that means it's back to the point that was said earlier. It means it's done politically at the level of groups because it's the social manifestation of that power is what constitutes political. And that is part of the message Fanon had. Because Fanon in The Damned of the Earth, the way the book ends, he not only, he basically said that the kind of creativity brought to the level of cultural practices should be brought to the level of how we look at power. That we need to understand we don't have to arrange power in the ways power has been historically raised. And that's why he closed by saying build new concepts. When he's talking about concepts, he's talking about the conceptual creativity to deal with different relations of power. Hey. Yeah. Say, say your name for everyone. Sure. Um, Uh, my name is Rami Abdosh. I'm a second year student in the MASS program. Um, uh, given the um, culture of the colonized world being wholly and inextricably tied uh, or constituted in and through uh, colonial violence, you know, an ontological condition in which every social relation, economic, cultural, physical, imaginary is organized by violence, uh, you know, based on you know, based on Fanon's uh, analysis. And these concepts that you're talking about, what examples have you seen in your research, in your experience of kind of ways in which various societies or peoples or communities are working to develop uh, these unique concepts and try to move away from uh, this this kind of uh, inherent, I don't want to say inherent, but colonial violence? Okay. Yes, yeah, we'll take more and more questions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm an alum of Georgetown University, um, but I think my question for you is, um, I think in some ways Fanon is describing what are scientific principles of our interrelated nature, like I think he says it, he phrases it in a way that others have said it before, and I'm thinking of in Catholicism, like living as a city of God before the city of God is manifested in the earth. Like, so creating a community in which you're changing your relationship despite the external structure. Um, and so when you pose this question of uh, the continuation of post-colonial violence, I think some of that can be um, avoided by establishing a plan for survival post-liberation, but manifesting and acting it now. Um, so, what does what does Fanon identify as um, a way to avoid that that kind of continual post-colonial situation? Um, and just also your thoughts about that. Okay, is there another person? Hello, my Hello. name is Michelle. Um, I'm the first chair at Johns Hopkins. Um, my question for you is, what is the best critique of Fanon you've ever seen um, related to any of his ideas or work? Sure. Okay, the first thing to bear in mind is that Fanon um, doesn't argue that colonialism is ontological. In fact, no human relationship is ontological. What actually goes on is that it strives to be ontological. You see? When I gave the example, for instance, of the effort to impose a Manichaean structure in the world, the contrary to course, that's the project of colonialism. It's not its, it's, not its achievement. Yeah, no, I, that wasn't my... Yeah. That was my OK. OK. Yeah, no, no, I didn't think that's what you yeah, were saying. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I need, in order to answer the other questions, I need to, to bring that premise out. Because, for instance, um, I'll give you an example. In, in, in some of my writings, I talk about um, an, an anti-black world. And some people read that to mean the world is anti-black. And the answer is no, the world isn't anti-black. That, 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 that the, but, but here's the crucial part. Why isn't the world anti-black? Okay? The reason is because a whole lot of black people and a lot of people who aren't black fought against the idea of making the world anti-black. I mean, that's the reason. Uh, the reason I gave for why, for instance, the demographics in this room are the way they are is because a lot of people fought for it. 
That's the political part, okay? But, um, but the question, the question um, that, the question that we have to bear in mind then is that we need to connect it and, and with it to, to some crucial concepts that, that, I, that I hope would be very useful, okay? Uh, there's a reason I talked about um, Hekka and all of that stuff around power, because a lot of people forget that the early church fathers and sisters were primarily African, and that they were creating concepts premised upon what was available in Africa, all the way from Oregon, Tertullian, to St. Augustine, okay? Uh, a lot of people don't know the complicated reason why, for instance, some chose to write in Latin instead of Greek. Uh, or why, because of why Greek at that time became like Spanish in this country. It became associated uh, more with an earlier period of a preferred group of colonizers. And that's why a lot of the Africans who were non-Christian preferred Greek, and the ones who were Christian preferred Latin, okay? But, but, but the concepts, so there were a lot of these African concepts that were brought into the discourses that was there by Augustine and others. But the era, the reason I also earlier brought up the problem of liberal political theory is because quite often one big problem that emerges in liberal political theory is that liberal political theory demands a supervenience of morality over politics. And in fact, I've argued that most most people in the United States who claim to teach political philosophy don't actually teach political philosophy. They teach implied moral philosophy. Okay? I say, right? Because po political life has contingency, and there are people who say they teach political philosophy and they never talk about power, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And so, but the problem, of course, is because they pose the issue as if it's about knowing the outcome before the performance. If you could just strategize the right things you should do, then you act. But that's not the way political life is. Our political life is contingent and sloppy. And so the, the first thing is, so we start with first premise. Because colonialism was never ontological, it was never complete. And the reason it was never complete is because it requires a form of lie to the self. The form of lie to the self is that it's possible to have to wage power over human beings without being in a relation with them. You see, it, it's already failed as a pro in its intrinsic project. Because if I'm going to say, I'm going to control you not to be in a relationship with me. I've already established some kind of, it's just a bad relationship with you. But I'm doing it, you see? So once we begin to understand that, we need to understand um, a crucial concept. And Fanon talks about this, but there are others. I, I write about it as well, is the concept of failure, okay? But before I do, I want to answer the, because that, that's a longer way. I want to get directly to the question. There are criticisms of Fanon. I, in a way, I've already wa waged one, which is that there's some, a lot about how people read Fanon depends on which Fanon they use to subordinate the other side of Fanon. So if you try to read Fanon exclusively through Lassie White Mass as a political solution to everything, they're going to be making a big mistake. Uh, this is one of the problems raised by Homi Baba because Homi Baba wanted to eradicate politics as a category, but at the same time, he was part of what emerged in the academy of the commodification of theory. And the commodification of theory made theory a marketable good, but the problem was, and this, this is related to, um, um, I, I'll just give the short version of this. The short version of this is, one has to understand that with, with Euro-modern colonialism also was the emergence of Euro-modern capitalism. <coughs> and and Euro-modern capitalism was unique in that, um, if I say the word market today, is there anyone in this room who doesn't think of capitalism? You, you see the point? What's absurd is there were always markets in the plural. Capitalism and market are not the same thing. Capitalism is an abstraction imposed upon markets. Human beings have had markets for more than 100,000 years. 
If you go around the planet and look at markets, look at where people go and gather, you'll notice the immediate issue. Humanity, historically, would go to markets not actually for profit. They may sell some things, but the main reason to go to markets over the ages, before the world of the internet, and newspapers, and so forth, was to meet people. And in fact, in many parts of the world, in fact, this is why people walk around aimlessly in malls. <laughs> because it's the socialization. And you might buy something, you might, but this is how human beings used to transport news and ideas from one community to another. And so markets were human spaces. There were places where people would gather, they would learn what each other do, talk. Sometimes people would spend a week at the market. They would camp out, they would, you know. However, um, if we leap over time to the period in which Euro modernity was being formed, at the time it wasn't called Euro modernity, they didn't even know what it was. They were just trying to do their thing. Um, some people began to argue that a problem with markets was that markets were too human. They need to be more efficient. So the argument was the more you can dehumanize the market, the more you can, you, uh, markets, you dehumanize it by having a particular market over all markets. And that became capitalism as the market. The notion of the market, that's an abstraction. What is the market, truthfully be told? It's God. But it's not God like the God we think of. It's a God controlling the others. And this abstract market, as a god has a theodicy, and that I could use easily because I'm at a Jesuit institution, so I hope many of you know what theodicy is. For those who don't, is how do you account for the existence of God in the presence of injustice or evil? Theodike, God's justice. And the argument is that if God has absolute power, how could there be evil? Is God evil? And they are to no, God can be evil, so then you have to deal with evil. And the two classic ways of dealing with evil is to say one, well, it only looks evil, but you know you don't know what God is really planning. Or two, God gave you freedom, you screwed it up, you're evil. Now, the main thing is that to maintain the omnipotence of God, that was imposed upon the market. The idea of the market was the market was, must be omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. It's all the features of God. And what happens there then, how does the market expand its reach? The market expands its reach through what we call the process of commodification. So mark, the, the market, so to speak, immediately commodifies religion. And that's why so many religions are subject to the market. Uh, we already know, because we're suffering about this right now in the world, the commodification of education. The idea is, to, because these are places that were historically sites that were limits of the market. See, religion was supposed to say, market, stop here. Markets now say, no, we're going to take you down, religion. Markets, education used to say, we have knowledge of the market. The market said, no, there'll be the market of education, the market of knowledge. All of these are commodification practices. Uh, it happened, and ultimately, the goal is the commodification of politics. And that has already happened. So in the commodification of theory, then, the way that the commodification of politics works with the commodification of theory is a form of theory that ironically presents politics as illegitimate. But ironically, it talk, presents politics as illegitimate through presenting itself as a political commodity. You see the ironic move? And that's why you have many people in the academy, for instance, who by virtue of their ability to do textual analysis offer themselves in a marketable form as political. So in that moment of the Homi Baba reading, that's part of the commodification of theory, ironically used to limit the political capacity of the text. Now, that, um, now, but, but there are moments with Fanon, in, in terms of, there, there, there are other areas of critique that one could have. For instance, the way Fanon looks at the question of specifically black music. Um, um, he looked at, he preferred bebop to blues. Uh, he hated Louis Armstrong. 
He, he loved Bebop because we, Bebop pissed off the white critics. Uh, because, let's face it, Bebop was producing Jesus. And a lot of white critics said, no, no, no. We want smiling, dancing, entertaining jazz black people, not Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, and this kind of stuff. Uh, it's a similar problem today in, in aesthetics. Fanon would be appalled uh, in many ways at what happened to hip hop because the initial hip hop he saw was, was, was challenging, certainly Germany's, but he, hip hop became reinscribed in the commodification of it. As, uh, and what happens, you know, and it's like, again, yeah, this is not all. This is not all. But what happened in, in it, uh, he argues, is, is that racism has become a kind of commodity. In other words, the, the scale and the complexity of black life is being reduced to a single element, okay? To the point where there are, it's as if the image of what it is to live as a black person is quintessentially and exclusively reduced to the question of racial subjugation. And no black person really lives that way. It, the truth is we have just died out a long time ago. The fact of the matter is we deal with it when we encounter it or when it's relevant. But you didn't brush your teeth this morning thinking about racism, <laughs> you know? And you don't, you know, and there are times when you go to a movie or if you're dancing or even when you're doing your studies or if you're thinking, or sometimes even when you're thinking about racism as an object, you're not subordinating yourself in the process because you're actively given a critique, you see? And so um, Fanon basically said that if, the, the, um, if racism disappears, so does the blues. The blues. What Fanon failed to see is what black music is. You see, black music is not exclusively an enslaved lament. I argue that black music is the layered motif of Euro modernity. And what do I mean by that? It means that in its effort to create rigid schisms about who constitute people and who do not, um, it has imposed upon people a form of immaturity. And that if you look carefully at, listen carefully to blues music or black music, I'm not saying every black artist does this. I'm talking the generic structure of the music. Black music is full of irony. And if you look particularly at blues lyrics, First thing you notice about blues lyrics is blues lyrics always makes the blues singer accountable. Richard Wright wrote about this. Racism, if, it, if you are degraded, if you are infantilized, you can never be responsible for your actions. Every blues song, the blues singer cries out responsibility for her or his actions. One of my favorite is by uh, Diane Washington. She has this great lyric. She said, uh, I got drunk last night and I took my wife to his, I mean, my man to his wife's front door. And then she repeats it. I got juice last night. I took my man to his wife's front door. And then the hook was, but she was a 45 packing mama, so I ain't gonna do that no more. Now, in that song, of course, it's full of humor and irony, but you know what she's saying, right? In the song, she's taking responsibility for an action, and she's saying that ultimately, she's, that it, there's another human being involved. If you look at a lot of, or the song, my man don't love me, he treats me awfully mean, right? Oh, this is a Billy Holiday, my man don't love me, he treats me awfully mean, all of this. And he said, well, my other man. <laughs> right? And there are all of these things in there. And why do they repeat lines? <coughs> So what Fanon was missing is that racism is but one element in the generation of the blues. The blues is about modern alienation. And that's why you could have someone in Beijing, you could have someone in Hobart, you could have someone in Stockholm, and you could have, you could have someone in Rio right now listening to the blues. And that person is not saying, I'm dealing with racism and enslavement. The person has personal identification because there is a form of alienation in the modern world. And 
part of that alienation, I've already hinted at. You know when I talked about politics? When you're able to be a political agent in a society, your actions can affect the society. Your actions matter. In fact, a lot of people missed the point from Alicia Garza and the others in Black Lives Matter. They were not only saying that black people are valuable, they're saying, no, your actions matter. But to do it, your actions have to matter, go out. You know, black lives matter lead to political action. Now, the question of political action, if a society negates politics, then your actions become more limited to your body. And when your actions become more limited to your body, the only place you can exercise agency is over yourself and you end up being obsessed with fixing yourself. Isn't that the story of all oppressed groups? But here's the part that's interesting. Pay attention. There's an increased number of people who are not historically in the category of oppressed group trying to fix themselves. There are white men all over the world trying to fix themselves. What's going on? That must tell you something is going on. It means the institutions of political action are being limited to almost everybody. You can spot it as they're trying to fix themselves. And so I, I'll get to my last point then about failure. And this is what's crucial that people don't understand. Um, to, I'm going to talk about failure. In fact, I'll talk about failure and I'm going to talk about failure. But I'll talk about failure in his writings. And um, there's a way people fail to understand failure. Okay? Here's the standard model of failure. Some of you may have done political work or student work or, you know, whatever organizing work. And you say, I have a great idea. What if, and somebody says, nope, nope. And what's usually the answer? We tried it. It doesn't work. It failed. Okay? Now, what, what you've often seen is somebody eventually pops up and said, well, let's try it again anyway. See what happens. And suppose a person does, and it succeeds. Now, the mistake we make is we say, how come you were able to do it and we couldn't? That's a big mistake. That, that's a failure to see what happened. See, the problem is we tend to think of people as things the way you think of this bottle as a thing or this cup of coffee. But if you think of people as relationships, and if you think of a system as a human created relationship, then every change in a relationship changes a relationship. So the energy that's put to suppress the effort to change the system has already diverted energy from another side of the system. And so the truth is, the person who popped up and said, let's try it, is doing so under different conditions than the people who initially tried it because those people who initially tried it changed the conditions. So the success is really we succeeded. It's just that the error is to think about the self across one generation of action. You see what I'm getting at? So this means you can see the crucial point. The issue with political action this relates to the earlier question that I, uh, about um, how do you know type stuff. The actions you don't know. Political actions are not about knowing the outcomes. It's about articulating the commitment that enables you to act because the action changes the conditions. You see? And that's why different people face different things. So I come to the last part because it relates a lot actually to Jared's initial question. Yeah, I just want to interject. Um, you know, we, we are we're kind of going over the time now, but I want to see you know, if you're happy to go on and if people you know, have I'm to sorry. leave. Your, no, 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 not at all. If you're happy to stay, you know, we can keep going because Louis is here, and you know, if, if you're okay with that, Louis. Sure. And if you have to leave, you know, please, um, please do so. Would you would you like to continue or um, yeah, leave yeah, it open? Yeah. I I think you know rather than we were going to take him to. Bulldog, but why are you well, we when we're here? We so, can continue there, but I'll tell the short no, I think, story. I just okay. wanted to see if it's okay with you. It's fine with you. You're fine to stay. If you, those who yeah. want to stay, shall we continue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and if you have to go, please feel free, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Yes, go ahead, wait, there's a question. So I just just repeat what you were saying. You were saying that political action is not about 
about the outcomes. It's about a commitment to... It's not about knowing the outcomes. Right. When you're going to act politically, it's about your commitments. Okay? And because you never know the outcomes. <coughs> Just like, for instance, the people who fought for this room to exist, they didn't know that this was going to be the outcome. Because there are people in this room, they, there are kinds of people in this room they never even imagined. Sometimes you go to rooms where political outcome are people, people who are fighting for the change, we're fighting for our rooms in which, for instance, people are LGBTQI. There are different racial formations today than before. There are all kinds of things they never anticipated. But that's, but the point is, they, but we entirely depend on their actions, you see? They weren't expecting, you know, a person like specifically me or Irene or any of you here. They could not, it's impossible. But they were committed to setting the conditions that something happened that was better than, and look, how do we know? Because a lot of us say, thank God they acted. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's the thing. If we were pissed off at them, then they failed. But the very short story is, is a story from Frederick Douglass. So I'll, I'll, it, it's just a short story. Um, a lot of people who read about Frederick Douglass read um, his first narrative, you know, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, and they read My Bondage, My Freedom, but they rarely ever read The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. And if you look at the three texts, something peculiar happens, and it relates to what we're talking about. Uh, there's a story he briefly mentions in the first narrative, that he, each text he moves it up a little closer, until the life and times of Frederick Douglass, it's right there at the beginning. And that is Frederick Douglass talks about his mother. Okay? Now the reason this is an important story, and it connects to everything we've talked about, is um, during the period of slavery, and by the way, we're right near where he was, right? Mar Maryland's right nearby, right? Uh, the child, when children were born, they were separated from their mothers and fathers. And they were often put to an old slave whose job it was, usually an old woman, to look after them till they're mobile enough to work. So Frederick Douglass was separated from his mother. Uh, his father was the master, uh, but you know, the, 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 the um, enslaved, if you have an enslaved mother, you're not free. So that was easy. And so he was sent to the, um, to the, um, to be reared by this basically woman caregiver, whom he imagined was his grandmother. And eventually he was sent to the big house, the plantation house, where he starts the brutalizing process into slavery. You know, this is where to make him, up to that point he's just a child playing, suddenly he's to be made into a slave. And as he's going through this brutality, when he was about seven years of age, it turned out his biological mother was on a plantation about 12 miles away and found out about where he was located. So each night for six months, she would, after enslaving in the fields, etc., walk the 12 miles to see him. Now today, you know, we drive cars. If you try to imagine walking in, the Mar in Maryland, uh, where at that time, where even they were, they were, they were slave catchers, they were wild animals, 12 miles to see a seven-year-old child. Sometimes, and she would spend time with him. Sometimes she would lie down with him, whatever she could do. And, and then she stopped. She died. Now, we have to understand this story from a child's point of view, OK? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your parents go through. Children think, and you hear this a lot from orphans, children think the absence of their parent means abandonment. They always blame the parent for the absence. It doesn't matter if your mother was a slave or your father was a slave, right? So you end up hating your mother or your father. However, if this woman comes and she does this, what's going on? And when I ask my students this, they always have the same answer. What this woman doing this is telling this child is in her actions, I love you. 
Now, here's the part where it gets rather striking. An enslaved child is told, is beaten to believe that his or her only value is as a commodity or an instrument for a master. To be valuable as a slave is only a use value. What then is the status of the value of love? You see, this woman's not going to get anything from it. She died. And so she introduces into the child, okay, this other value. When Alicia Garza tweeted Black Lives Matter, she was saying that you are valuable. She was just saying, I love you. She, she in fact said it. It's a love poem. But here is the crucial part. If Frederick Douglass, the child, says, I'm not like you other slaves. I'm loved. I'm valuable. You all are just commodities. He would have missed the point. At that moment, he would just grow up to be an arrogant slave. The crucial issue, and Douglas says this in the life and times of Frederick Douglass, is everything that society says that an enslaved woman cannot give you value. It's not valuable to be loved by a slave. So what transformed Frederick Douglass into a revolutionary was to value the value of being loved by someone the society said was not valuable. You see the difference there? And that is what creates the change, because it means we have to deal with a completely different system of value and political relations. It means, for instance, um, how do you deal with dialectics of recognition all the way to the epistemic level? Ideas from black people, from Native American people, from, from people in, 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 in West Asia, in Southeast Asia, you see what I'm getting at? It becomes a, a transformation of value and being valued by the man. And that means, although she died, her activities and his understanding it was a transmission into actions that set the condition for a lot of other actions to come. And so we should ask ourselves when we do political work, because her love, her action, was from her commitment, because she had no reason to know the outcome. OK. That's what I want to end. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Just really briefly, but as you were speaking about that, I was reflecting a little bit on um, Fred's Fanon's kind of, it's almost like he's moving towards the social model of disability, what we call it, but it doesn't quite get all the way there in his recognition of um, the way in which certain things are pathologized as being themselves construct of a society that is racist, that is heteronormative, that is all sorts of other things, right? And it's, it's imposing, through those structures, imposing upon people the certain designation of, of lack, of being pathologized, of being disordered. So this idea that, for instance, being a person in a colonial state will very justifiably experience things that society might want to categorize as disordered in some way, right? Um, and in, in thinking about that and hearing you kind of reflect on this revolutionary love and what that meant and this, this idea and notion of value, I'm struck by the ways in which Fanon also, though, and in part because of his training as a psychiatrist, I would think, um, very much also uses this medical model of disability by using, in, in his writings, metaphors and language that, um, in, in critiquing certain things, using language of pathology to do so, right? Um, and kind of leveraging this idea that um, certain things are defective and using path, kind of a, a language of pathology to, to describe it as such. And the reason why I'm bringing it up now, as you mentioned that, is um, there then seems to be a distinction he's making necessarily by doing that of um, 
Well, certain kinds of, of what we might call a neurodivergence, or something that isn't typical of how people should neurologically experience the world, that this, that when it's the product of colonialism or racism or these big social agents that are oppressive, that is inherently different and okay um, from a pathology or a disability that is somehow intrinsic to a person, right? Something that is medical in nature, that requires a cure as opposed to, for instance, healing. Um, and that strikes me, as, as you were speaking about that, um, as, as being a, quite problematic, actually, um, given that the way in which we need to deconstruct how value is ascribed to certain people and not others is, is not through these dichotomizing ways, or falsely dichotomizing ways, but in really critiquing the entire system by which value is given to certain people and not others. And I was wondering if, just briefly, perhaps, if you could just touch on that, or, or maybe I'm understanding this incorrectly, but it, it just seems like it's he, he was able to do it successfully in his um, analysis of all of these discourses, but perhaps didn't see it when it came to disability. And that concerns me in this very still eugenics era. <laughs> well, there's several things. The short version is, I was just ending with that other story to talk about the question of value and failure. But the thing with Douglas, specifically, is that, you know, Douglas eventually stands up against Kobe. That's an individual struggle. But he, and then when he escapes and he's by himself, individually, if he's stuck with a liberal model about the self, he could just hide out as an, as a, as an individually um, a slave, um, a former slave. So the question is, he went to the realm of public appearance, and eventually, as we know, he had to go to Ireland where a fee was paid for his freedom. But the thing is, the crucial issue is, Frederick Douglass understood that freedom had to be a political activity. So he got involved in political action. The thing with Fanon that I was hinting at before is similar. It, it's not exactly in the formulation that, 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 that you, 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 you had there. Because in the morning, I was pointing out the limitations of trying to imagine an individual can deal with those things. But the danger is when we forget that a society is a, uh, is, is, is a constellation of human actions. So it's a human phenomenon. Now, with the question of meaning, that, would, that requires a longer, quest, longer response. But the, the, the short version is there's a lot of wonderful work the classic work is by Bert, um, Bertrand Luckmann, but it's on social construction of reality. And a lot of people think it's about the fiction of reality, but it isn't. What it's arguing is that human beings are able to create the communicative practices of meaning. And because we are able to do this, we can also create alternative forms. So the question when I talked about Hecke and power is the problem with the way we talk about disability is that we, we, try, we, we try to deal with disability as something intrinsic without dealing with the other element, which is the HECA element, that which will facilitate the action. So there are many ways through which actually to be, to, to, to be able to function in a society if a society is committed to that function. See, that's the error people make. The error isn't, isn't, is, isn't simply about the, the physicality of people. The, the real error is about the question of where we're going to invest our social forces. And the fact of the matter is, there are many groups that we have devoted a lot of energy to, which is why they're able to succeed. I put it this way, I put it this way when I'm in South Africa. Um, one of the standard things that's said today in the world is a complete misrepresentation of history. It's always formulated this way. Why are white people successful and people particularly of Africa not? That's, you know, and they said, well, there must be something about white people that make white people so good at succeeding, and something about black people that make black people so, well, terrible at succeeding. However, it belies the force of history. If you look at history, actual history, just a short time, because a lot of people don't know African history. But if you look at even this country's history, just 150 years ago, the fact of the matter is, a lot of white people were, 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 had all kinds of limitations. But the concept of manifest destiny and organization of building economies around creating white development, it was articulated in that way, white development, meant that there was an investment in creating white wealth. You see? And if you look at it somewhere like South Africa as an example, 
white South Africans had access to free education. They, had, they, they didn't have to pay for water. They had all kinds of resources that created a buffer. In this country, there were all kinds of mechanisms in the social welfare state to create structural white wealth. Now, what that means, but when, when blacks come in, they become privatized. A lot of these, they, they're coming in to play the game, but they don't have the heck of the conditions for the game. Now, so, but the thing that's interesting that people miss is today the ideological formulation is to hammer that social welfare states don't work. You hear it everywhere. I always have to remind people, the knockdown, drag, drag out argument that social welfare states work is white wealth. It produced structural white wealth. It works. The, um, no, that, that's, that's just the fact. Well, similarly, in disability, you could say a similar thing. You can, there are many, in other words, it's not that simple, but human beings, as long as the relationship is to make certain things work, we have to ask what our commitments are. The reason right now there is a lot of structural black poverty in the world is because there's not a commitment to getting rid of it. There's a commit, there was a commitment to white wealth, structural white wealth. In fact, there's a lot of argument, even if you put the formulation structural black wealth, people call it racist. But the fact of the matter is, if you put it to the side and just say social welfare states, the fact of the matter is the, the, the bottom line living condition for many peoples, particularly if you go, I go to the social welfare states and looked at them before they start getting to dissolve in these two. In, in Europe, the bottom levels are similarly there. There are things that are available across racial lines in the structure of those states. So, but that, a lot of people don't want you to get to that real issue, that social welfare states actually work. And so the focus on intrinsic black pathology blocks it from that. When blacks didn't have access to that, the real social welfare state. You see what I'm saying? I'm sorry. Sorry, just going off that point, so then flip side of the arguments about uh, structural white wealth or uh, uh, social welfare uh, working in, in creating white wealth is that those countries are uh, homogenous. They're ethnically and racially homogenous. Like if you're looking at uh, Norway and uh, you know the Scandinavian countries, and within those uh, states where you do have minority populations, they do tend to be excluded from those structures, or they're marginalized to a point. So in a way, in this country where you have such diversity, and that's used as an argument as to why social welfare practices wouldn't work here, because the country is too big, it's too many people. But it also rests on this idea that it's, it's too diverse. Yeah, the problem, that, yeah, that, that argument doesn't really work, because it, it still elides the basic form, form of the economic argument, mm -hmm. that if those people have that access, it work. Right. So the real issue isn't about the social welfare state, it's about access. Right. The second, in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a polite, more polite way of just saying there's racism. Right. Uh, but, but the second part is that not, it's not actually true in a lot of those countries that historically they were, they were as homogeneous as, as we think. Um, a lot of the histories of those, of, of those countries has been, have, have been rewritten. For instance, when you think of Elizabeth in London, they don't think of the 10,000 black people who are living there. Um, but, but, but that still is getting besides the point. The main point is this. Um, the main point is, is the fact that many began to give up on the social welfare state when the question of colored access emerged. That's the real issue. Why do they want to give it up? And the answer is because it works. You see? They announce it's given up because of its failure. But if it failed, then there should be structural white poverty. But it works. So, so that means in a lot of the African countries, and a lot, of, and we see it also in East Asian countries, the implementation of a social welfare state structure actually does create the conditions for structural wealth. We see it with China now. All the evidence shows that. So, um, but that other part, that's that's where racism becomes relevant. Uh, in this country, it's a similar thing. It's the people don't want it anymore because they don't want certain other groups of people have access to it. However, um, 
even there, it's not necessarily so. It's a little more complicated. That's how it's commented up. But because, you see, um, we have to remember that it's not like you have um, an ideological presentation and another group who's the opposite of it just say, okay, let's see if it works. The truth of the matter is, in every effort to make things work in the United States, there have been historically people fighting tooth and nail to make sure it doesn't. And that's why I say these things are political. Pol political doesn't mean you just do it. <laughs> it means you're doing it with opposition. And you're negotiating opposition to what you're trying to achieve. Yes. Oh, what's your name? Uh, Rustel. My name is Rustel, so I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, curious. Uh, would you say Fanon had uh, absolutization of the violence and the role of the violence in the uh, in, uh, liberation of the nations? Because um, in uh, his chapter concerning the violence, he had that very, I would say, not humanistic idea, like we will build the revolutionary consciousness, it will go and slaughter colonizers and settlers together. Only this way how we can obtain that uh, political consciousness. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you say like a lot of uh, chaos, or for example, some uh, uh, new nations, some liberated nations had related to that issue, like for example, expropriation of the white farmers in uh, Zimbabwe or in uh, South Africa without whatever um, any any sort of compensation and violence uh, related to that. Is that sort of like continuation of that idea? Violence would be useful to mobilize the nation and build the nation and continue with post-colonial development? Well, I mean, earlier, I, I talked a lot about that earlier when I talked so about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I talked about the problem of continued violence, that, that, that violence as a legitimating practice doesn't work. That, so that's not what Fanon was arguing. And the error people make is that they try to maintain violence as a, may, as, as a way of trying to keep a society together, when in fact that cannot work as well. One big error, though, when we talk about white farmers in Zimbabwe or in South Africa, is that we have to understand that there, is, there was a global commitment to making sure that certain societies do not work. And in a lot of cases, for instance, in Zimbabwe, there's a lot of misrepresentation of what's going on there. So for instance, every time you make a transition, there's a period in which things are not functioning because the definition of functioning is the old system. So it reminds me of like whites I used to meet in South Africa who, say, who left South Africa in 1994, and then they would return like in 2000 and say, man, you know, the." The, um, the property they had was going to pieces, everything's going to pieces, and they don't realize that their properties function the way they did because they had their slave labor. In other words, if you, of course if people are not being forced to live at some minimum wage to maintain it, it's going to go, but maybe it needs to go and have a new organization of how to build it. And this is the main point. Certain transitions do need processes of deterioration for different kinds of relationships to develop. Um, but some people, what they really want to have is the colonial system of value, but in a post-colonial state. And so what they, in effect, are doing is they are against the normativity of colonialism, right? Many people today don't say, present as, as, as the, the prescription colonialism, but they want the outcomes of colonialism. So if you look at like, what's happening in Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, Iraq, uh, all over the place. Uh, it's colonialism that's ashamed of itself. It is colonialism continued. And so the real question is to get, is to let go of that kind of a practice. But if one has to understand, it means letting go of a lot of other things. There, there, there are other outcomes that emerge from it. And this is the thing we have to accept. If I may compare it with the question of gender, if one is going to let go of the idea that the proper relationship between a man and a woman is that a man dominates a woman, one has to understand that what the outcome you have to be is a different kind of man. And it means a different kind of woman. Because the woman on the current condition is one who understands herself as dominated by a man. So it means that both would have to change in their relationships. And there's a lot of evidence as we are going through a lot of gender, gender political social changes, that these, these are having 
physiognomical effects. Uh, because there's certain kinds of things that men and women have to do that require a different kind of embodiment, different amounts of estrogen, different amounts of testosterone, all kinds of things. And there's some people lament the change, but the truth of the matter is our different, our evolving physio physiology is more suitable for the social world we're building. And so similarly, the kind of whites that we will be looking for have, in, 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 in these kind of societies may be kind of people who are not invested as white in the way we understood white before. It has to be a different kind of people. And, and that would mean also a very different kind of black people. Can we say in advance what they would be? The answer is no. It has to be the ongoing project of building those societies that do it. The danger, of course, though, is going to be those who can only understand themselves in terms of a racist dialectic. You know, because then you can only have, always in society, friends and enemies. Okay? You don't have, in other words, citizenship. Oh, hi. Can I ask a question? Um, I want to ask about how we can transform the political capacity of text into political action. I mean, we, we study a lot about, we talk about theories, and then the question is, okay, how do we take it and translate it into action? And I'm thinking what your thoughts are about transnational social movements. You mentioned Black Lives Matter. I'm thinking the boycott, divestment, sanctions. Are they seen as effective tools to ch really challenge the, the structure of political violence that you know a lot of groups are experiencing across uh, I, I think that's, yeah, uh, uh, the, all the things I've argued so far say that's the wrong question. And let me explain why. Um, political activity is contingent. If you're involved in it, you don't know if it will work or not. You have to think about what the commitments are. Theoretical work is part, it, it has a different function, you see? And so if, if theoretical work could just be applied, and a theorist would be like a god, okay? Theor theoretical work is something very different. Um, theory, uh, I have to do it short because we a long time, but there's a, there's a three-day lecture I give on theory. But the short version, but the short version, the short version is theory is an effort to articulate our relationship to reality and simultaneously seeing what that relationship is, you see? Theory is first and foremost about knowledge, but simply knowing is insufficient for changing. You see? And we need to understand that. It's not that the theory is, and in some cases, it's not that the theory is formed and then there's the action. And in some cases, it's the action that's generating the theory. Yeah. 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 I just quickly wanted to return to this idea of the invisibility and I'm thinking about invisibility as it relates to um, what we conceive of as um, cultural appropriation. And I'm wondering how it is that we can talk about cultural appropriation, especially as it relates to black culture, without reducing it and reducing ourselves to like this essentialist and like sort of characterized. That I could answer quickly. Yeah, of, you know. First, I reject appropriation. I think it's a false thesis. Right. Second, I reject black culture. It's a false thesis too. Okay? And in fact, and because both are premised upon authenticity, and I reject authenticity. In fact, I argue the most authentic thing human beings are is inauthentic. And the reason is authenticity requires a form of closure. Why do I reject appropriation? Culture is not something you own. Culture is something you participate in. Uh, there are many ways people, people participate in culture. And what it does, what we're confusing, what we're calling appropriation, is not actually appropriation, but misrepresentation. Mm. So for instance, historical misrepresentation lies to us about the origins of cultural production, okay? So, but, but, but ultimately, I explained to you that a black person, for instance, um, developed filament for the light bulb. Does that mean then only black people should use light bulbs? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's the, you see the logic going there. But here's the thing, the band, there are many examples, but if most people talk about the level of popular culture. And the thing that struck me about the appropriations argument is they fail to actually deal with the value of the cultural production. 
A, a good example is there was one time I was getting gasoline and I heard some really great music going on. I, mean, I was thinking, I remember, I was like, wow. You know, one of those moments where you start dancing to it. I'm thinking, wow, what else? That? And when I turn around, this white guy got into the car and he was like, boom. It was his music. He was listening. But then it struck me at that moment. There was nothing about him that was trying to be black. The reason he was doing that was because the music was good. We, we do a disservice to our cultural production if we fail to deal with its value. And it struck me that if, if it's not valuable, people are just not going to use it. They're not going to use it. And this is where we're making a mistake. We, we're, we're erasing the history of how many valuable things we create. When I talk with Native Americans, there's so many things in this country that people just cannot do if, if we don't talk about the Native American history of it. From foods to certain linguistic expressions. I mean, corn, potatoes, but it's not just there. Certain ways of doing farming. These are not indigenous ways of doing farming to, to Europe. <laughs> and a lot of the farming techniques in this country are from Africa. Irrigation techniques, all of this stuff. Okay? Well, my point is, it, you know when I talk about the market? Not, not the market, but markets. It's the same thing continuum. People are just going to use what they enjoy and what's useful. The big thing that we need to do as scholars is to not get into the racist game mm -hmm. of the erasure that, that presents people as if there are only, there's only one set that does and another set that can't do anything. That's a misrepresentation of history. Uh, yeah. Oh. There's just, there's a quick uh, follow-up. I agree with what you're saying that that culture is about uh, participation, not ownership necessarily. But isn't it that different groups historically have had um, there have been disparate abilities to participate in different cultures, and so it's not this equal exchange where I mean, taking myself as an example as um, daughter of Indian immigrants. Me participating in American culture is not the same as when white Americans go to India and participate in my culture there. So it's not an equal exchange of power in, in that way. Yeah, but that's a different issue. That's just, that's my point. That's about an equal exchange of power. Is but that it's, not a, a part of, of the issue of appropriation? No, because appropriation treats culture as something that you can actually own and take. Mm -hmm. No matter, you know, no matter how much they may try to do that, that's not going to stop Indians from doing things that, and you know, Punjabi from doing Punjabi, uh, people Tamils from doing, I'm part Tamil, uh, from doing what we do. We just do it. Uh, there are people, uh, I, I'm Jewish. Uh, there are a lot of white Jews who have rewritten Jewish history as if Jewish history was white. It just isn't. That's not going to stop me from doing what I do. It, what it means is I have a responsibility as a scholar to say that history is misrepresented. And also, it also points out something very different. It always surprises a lot of white Jews when I talk to them how many things they do that they think is Jewish that isn't. Because they have no idea that all they did was take another cultural practice and gave it a Jewish meaning. Stepping on the glass at a Jewish wedding. That's Persian. Jew being Jewish through your mother. That was Roman, not Judean. You used to be Jewish through your father. I could go down a long list of things. Uh, here's one of the big things for Ashkenazi Jews. Chicken soup. No, nobody who's Jewish can think of being Jewish without chicken soup. It's Chinese. There were no chickens in Europe. There were, <laughs> chickens came from China. That's why we did, right? Potatoes. Can you think stuff or? like latkes? Latkes, like right. They're all coming like Belarusia, Russia, from that part of the world. No, so. no, no but, but, but the potato is from Peru. You see what I'm getting at? So, no, when it, if that's not a case of appropriation of potato. That's a case of using the value of the potato mm -hmm. and bringing it into the context of Judaism and giving it a Jewish meaning. You see? However, there would be something weird if Ashkenazi Jews go to Peru and say, y'all shouldn't be eating potatoes, you're violating my culture. That would be weird. The, the Peru, people in Peru say, what the hell are you talking about? We have 150 different kinds of potatoes. You all know, have a potato. You see, and we can make many examples. Um, it's, it's striking, um, but here's the thing. Um, when people do participate in the activity, the point is they always bring something to it that the other groups don't. Like one of the things that's striking, because I, I love cooking, 
And I, um, a lot of people, I, one of the things I hate is to go to when any restaurant that says <coughs> authentic. It's really crappy food. Because the problem is, it's like a zombified food frozen in the way it was done. Good food takes advantage of the local resources. So a good Chechuan place, for instance, may use leeks if they're local, or different kinds of onions, and different things that fits the flavor. They, people are always bringing something as well. Um, the meaning of Africa and Europe, we have jazz, we have a lot of contemporary music, but the fact is, there's a lot of Africa in it. And so, yeah, but I, I, I don't accept the appropriation argument, but I do think you're completely right. What we need to fight against is a different issue, which is, which is the Manichaean issue of trying to black out people's capacity mm -hmm. to participate in, in, in exchange practices of the production of culture. Yeah. I just want to go back to the previous question um, that Summer asked. Thank you, by the way. I know you got to go. No, yeah, it's really sorry. I would love to see okay. yeah. it. Just, just you know, for purposes of discussion, um, what was it about that that was the wrong kind of question? And also, could you expand more what you're saying about the you, what's the you know, theoretical function? You know, the function. What's the, the, the theoretical work? What kind of different function it is to have? Just as a purpose of opening up that. Sure. The, the reason is the wrong kind of question. By the way, when I say wrong kind of question, I'm not saying yeah. you are wrong. Yeah, <laughs> the wrong kind of question is that it's based on an exclusive disjunction of one or the other, but not both. Of what? In other words, in other words, the idea that there's theory, and then you apply the theory. And what I'm saying is theory always emerges in a relational world that's simultaneous with practice. And it's just that the aim of theory is very different from the particular aim of certain practices. But both don't know the outcome in advance. So ultimately, what theory brings to action is that theory plays a role in the production of meaning in the practice of actions. I put it this way. Um, oh, take care. OK, sorry, bro. It's not, it's OK. The, um, Put it this way, I, there's an example I give about what it is to have an experience. And I put it this way, quite often what some people think the model is, is that um, um, when people have an experience, they think the experience automatically has the knowledge content. But many people have experience of trying to figure out their experience. And when you have the experience of trying to figure out your experience, you often go to a friend or another to discuss what happens. And that's the practice of bringing meaning or a theory to the experience. You see? Now, that ordinary practice of bringing meaning or a theory to the experience, um, if you're in a world that blocks that activity, what you do instead is you don't participate in the production of the theory you're bringing to the experience. What you do instead is you treat a, a, a hegemonic side of the theory to bring to it. A good example is a lot of people in my studies say, I want to bring theory to the experience. I'm going to read Foucault, Derrida, Hegel. Okay? Or a lot of women say, I want to bring theory to, to women's experience. I'm going to read Lacan. I'm going to read Foucault, and etc. Now, here's the, the thing. It's not that they don't have something to offer. The problem is what made them develop their theory in the first place was the practice of bringing theory to their experience. So if you're going to say they are the exclusive legitimate side, side of theory, then you don't realize you're saying their experience is more legitimate than yours. So that means then if you're going to say that theory comes from the relationship to the experiences being produced. It means you must take on the responsibility of building the theory. But that means then that the theory comes, it doesn't follow that the experience or the practice you have matches on to that theory. You see? At that point, because if you treat theory that way, then the theory becomes one size that fits all. But in my writings, I argue that that's a form of what's called decadence on theory because it treats the theory as closed.
However, what theory is, is an ongoing relationship to reality, which means the actual political commitments and practices are generating new theoretical questions. So if the theory is living, the theory isn't fixed, but the theory is also evolving in the very practice you're engaged in. So that's why they can't, that's why the question, when it comes to the political question, say for instance like Palestine, okay, the kind of commitments there, is people could give all the algorithms, people could give all the theories they would like. That, those, that, that's a more epistemic, instrumental theory. Then there are other theories, normative theories, okay, which is the question of what should, should people be doing and how they should go about it. But again, although those are there, in the actual practice of trying to transform those conditions, people are going to discover things they could never have accounted for. And that's why I was saying that in the end, the fundamental question one has to ask is the question about what one is committed to. There's a, there is a space where there's a different kind of theoretical, political question that can come about. And one of them I could, I could mention very quickly is that we have a tendency still to treat political problems as if they're completely isolated from the larger network of political problems across the globe. So there are people who subordinate all issues to the Israel-Palestine question, all issues to the black-white question, all, we could go down the line. The problem is that um, the historical conditions under which we deal with those problems have changed. Uh, we're living in a world right now of rapid global access to information, technologies of movement that move us faster than any other period in history, access to implementations of destruction that are unparalleled, and ecological challenges that are really unusual. In short, we now live on a smaller planet. And we're trying to resolve our problems through political institutions that were designed for the 18th and the 19th century. I don't see how we could resolve the problems that we're looking at today, honestly, without trying to develop political relations that are indigenous to the 21st century. And right now, I, I could even go further and be very blunt <coughs> on how I think of it. Um, the right wing have always known that the future of humanity is a radical globalism. But they don't want the globalism that's humanistic. Radical glo humanistic globalism requires a global federalism, which means you get rid of nation states. Uh, what they want is a radicalized localism, but a global privatized movement of capital. That's exactly <laughs> what Putin's doing. That's exactly what the people right now nearby in the White House are doing. It's exactly what China's doing. That's why they actively worked to destroy the possibilities of federalisms across the globe. Because our planet was clearly moving in a direction very quickly of possibly three federal structures. And once those federal structures had agreements with each other, you know what you have? A global federal structure. If you have a global federal structure, you no longer need militaries. You no longer have passports. You don't need visas. It means workers can move wherever they'd like. It means you don't have the vulnerability of capital. It means you don't even really have an Israel-Palestine question anymore. You don't even have anything. You don't even have all the, these questions that are going on around, around um, um, Libya. You don't have questions about those with South Africa, etc. You have a completely different kind of global structure. It also means you don't have world presidents. Because that just won't work. It means you can have different structures through which you deal with representation of successive um, 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 organizations of powers of citizenship that deal with councils across the globe that can actually really respond to issues like climate change, really respond to issues like global health care, really respond to issues like clean water and global education. And in fact, we see this happening right now because few people on our planet today really expect their grandchildren to live where they were born. Because life in a tiny planet that depends upon the movement of employment, 
requires the constant movement of people according to what would work for them. And a refugee crisis would disappear precisely because there would be no borders that people can cross. And they know this. And they've been theorizing how to block this uh, since the late 1950s. Uh, nothing we're seeing in the world today is a function of flukes. These were fought through at think tanks and other places, but even they have a certain problem. Because this is the other side, the flip side of my response to you, because they too thought they could just get the right theory and put it into practice. But they had no way of anticipating that what they want to put into practice cannot address climate change. It cannot address problems of global ecological disaster, but there's another thing they didn't anticipate. The people who were theorizing for how to create the world we live in today were in a world in which people actually cared about their descendants. They didn't expect that they were organized in a system that's best run by psychopaths. And if you look at the people right now who are dominating privatized capital, they are people who, frankly, don't even care about their children. It's really about their immediate gratification of the accumulation. And that unanticipated aspect of neoconservatism and neoliberalism means they have to save face, but the truth is their theory is just leaking at the seams. For the same reason, on the other side, we face the same problem. Because we are not gods. We're, we're human beings <coughs> trying to find a way to bring um, clarity, meaning, and intelligibility to our actions. Okay. Okay. Leave it on that, on that okay. profound note. And before we go, please help me to, oh, sure. to thank. Um, Last standing. You know, for us who know Lewis, you know, as the intellectual, as the thinker, and the, the huge contribution he's making to the, you know, to knowledge. Um, also, Lewis Gordon, the man, um, who is, um, as I said, this generosity of spirit, who travels the world engaging people in so many different kinds of ways. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you Louis, uh, for being with us. And yeah, that's <laughs>